Hi, friends, and welcome to this very exciting edition of Reach the World's live stream series for the Endurance 22 Expedition. My name is Chris Ahern. I am Director of Partnerships here at Reach the World, and today is a very special day. I am thrilled to see such a large contingent of students, teachers, and other followers from all over the world just to tune into this live stream. So please put your location in the chat box. We wanna know where all of you are coming from. Now, before I bring in Tim and our very, very special guests, we have a, a very special video for you all. I hope you enjoy. I really have to tell you, it's top secret. Well, it's not gonna be top secret for long, but it's probably the most exciting news that we could share with you. Celie, do you wanna sit? Oh, Celie's being shy. Um, Let's see, let's zoom out a little bit and see if you can guess. Where are all these people out on the ice? Who's driving the AUV? We must have found something, maybe? You think? Folks, that's right. We found the Endurance, the amazing crew and expeditionary team aboard the SA Gullis II found the Endurance in, in about 10,000 feet of water in incredibly difficult conditions. And I am so thrilled to be able to welcome not just my friend and colleague, Tim Jacob, but two extremely important people who were, who May, had massive contributions to this incredible find. So Tim, Menson, Chad, welcome. Hello. Hey, Chris. Hey, Explorers. Welcome once again to the SA Gullis 2. If you missed all of our previous live streams from the ship and this expedition, you have come to the right one today because we have, as you just saw, some amazing news. Um, if you've been paying attention to the news this morning, it's been going around the world. Um, but you, the students at home and the teachers who've been following us from the beginning, I think we're at somewhere around 25,000 students in 27 countries who have been following this expedition over the course of the last few months. You're the ones we really, really want to celebrate with today because finding the endurance is a massive historical achievement. Uh, it is, would not have been possible with all the amazing members of this expedition. And I'm so excited to have two of the most critical members of the expedition sitting here uh, with me today. We have Menton Bound, Director of Exploration, Marine Archaeologist with the expedition, and Chad Bonin, AUV Supervisor. So AUV Supervisor, I know a lot of you really, really loved the Saab Sabertooth and have all kinds of questions about what was that what was actually happening on the back deck? We couldn't tell you the whole story, but now it's time to spill the beans and talk all about how this expedition, this amazing team, found the wreck of the endurance. I, I'm gonna say it again a hundred times because I still can hardly believe it that we found the wreck of the endurance. Right. I mean I believed it, but I didn't believe it until I saw it. Yeah. And we saw it. Shouted from the rooftops. Yeah. 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 We can shout it from the rooftops. Why don't I start with you, Ted, because you were uh, always on the back deck. You've been working around the clock uh, to find the endurance day and night, yeah. uh, keeping those AUVs down underwater as long as possible and doing the scanning. What did you feel when you first saw the endurance pop up on uh, the, <laughs> so, or the video? Yeah, it was, um, it was uh, the first pass was a resolution side scan uh, imagery but it was a uh, very defined target. So when I walked into the, the, the online shelter, uh, the, the, the operations center, where it was at, um, you know, my, we had to still verify it, but when I saw that target, I just, you know, I knew it was more of a defined target. It was something very interesting right there. And legs from the waist down went weak, you know, because uh, the other targets that we were finding throughout the project, you know, we they were they were not as crisp, not as clear clean as this one. So yeah, it was my my first reaction was we found it. 
Uh, but we have to verify. <laughs> no, Can you so. just generally describe like what most of the seabed of the Weddell Sea looked like so we can understand what a target that would accept <clears throat> that line yeah, would so look like? Throughout the entire search for the, uh, the endurance, the, the, the seabed on the Weddell Sea was pretty much flat. So any, anything out of the ordinary would, would pop up like red flags. You know? So we found you know, quite a few disturbances with rocks and this and that that were we thought were pretty interesting at first, but you again you have to go and inspect and verify. And you can, you know, usually when you can see that on a, a resolution scan, right? And you can kind of tell, okay, that might be just geology and stuff like that. And that's why I say this one here, it was standing up like a like the red flag, like a thumb off the sea bay, because the rest of every everything else was completely flat. And just that defined target, you know, that was what was so interesting about it. Amazing. Yeah. And Mason, how about you? When you saw that image, what did you feel? Yeah, well, it's a different story. Um, you remember on the day we were actually in the middle of that great big flow, mm -hmm. big slab of ice, we chewed our way in to get the ship nice and stable to do search. And um, myself and my <laughs> colleague John, we'd been sort of talking for a couple of days about how we needed to get off the ship. And, it would stretch our legs. So there's that big, huge iceberg off to stop mm -hmm. about a quarter and a half away. Yeah. And John and I thought, okay, this is the day. Let's go for a walk and we'll head out there and check out the iceberg. So we set off together. It was about uh, a little before four o'clock, it was. Uh, we just didn't know a little after the four o'clock thing was going to happen. So we went to the to the iceberg, it must have been away about an hour and a half. There was some the daily penguins there beside the iceberg, and you know, we we're really enjoying ourselves. We came back to the ship. The moment, I mean, the moment we set foot on board, the intercom on the ship was yelling our names get up in the bridge, get up in the bridge. Yeah, and so we just raced up the stairs. I uh, I had to look, I didn't see Chad, but I saw one of the other back guys there. And he had this like weird smirk on his face. <laughs> so John was kind of worried that maybe there'd be an accident with the uh, saber tooth or something like that. And I kept remembering that, that look I got. It was some red salt. And I got that sort of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, this, this is a good look. I was getting. So I'm going up the stairs, <coughs> running up three steps at a time. And I think it could be good news. could be good news. And we got onto the deck there. And the next skipper was there, Freddie. And the master was there, knowledge. And I call Nico was there. He's like in charge of all types of operations. And he held up his telephone like that to me. And he said, Gents, I want to introduce you to the endurance. <laughs> and it was just the first beautiful picture of it. Yeah. I mean, it was incredible. We got better pictures and the days would follow it. That, that, that first picture just blew my, blew my brain, brain away. Yeah. And it really straight away it was endurance. I mean, there are no other wrecks in the world. We'll see. And uh, you know, so happy beards. Well, we have all seen the pictures and the videos, and they're sort of running through our minds. But I want to show you now, our student audience, um, what that AUV saw uh, when it went down for its close inspection. We have a video uh, ready to go uh, that shows some of the highlights. And I'll ask, um, as uh, Chris is bringing that up on the screen, I want to ask um, Menson if he could just sort of explain what we're looking at. Okay, um, it's go. I haven't seen this before, but let's try it. Oh. Okay, here we go. Have you seen this before? Mm. Me neither. It's going to take a wild guess to say they stopped. <laughs> nope, that was good. Okay, there you go. All right, so whoa. bring back that picture. So just to let everyone know, while while uh, Menson's taking a look at this and and trying to find some spots to to narrate, we are on a little bit of a delay. We are talking live of, with the SA Agullis two as it is is currently in transit. Our signal isn't great, so. If there's if there's some uh, some resolution issues with our friends on board or as you're watching the video, we do apologize, but we want you to understand that this is something where we're able to speak with these amazing explorers live on camera. Uh, so so we do apologize if if there are any issues with that. But um, but if we can uh, maybe just quickly restart the video. I know we've been seeing a few different things. 
Um, but um, but the this footage um, this footage I believe uh, Menson begins uh, at the at the stern. Uh, so um, so if you want to maybe talk about what you saw there. Yeah. Okay, guys, we have the stern, and the first. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing I draw your attention to is the name of the ship, Endurance, in big, bold, capital letters, right across the stern, and right below the name was the right beneath the name was the Polaris Star, after which it was originally named. And we're looking at the well deck there, and that is the ship's steering wheel. Unbelievable. Now we're coming down from the bow of the ship. We're moving to the back of the ship. We're moving aft, and you can see there. The broken foremast snapped off and again look at those two portholes there because that's one end of the ship's pantry and galley and uh, at the bow again a little bit of damage there but look at the curves look at the shape of the bow that uh, that was the part which struck the ice when they tried to to breach the ice and you can see little animals growing there I can see an anemone there a lot of little filter feeders here and there we even got a crab if you look closely and now we're down, let's see, around about the midships area. And those dead eyes there are what we call train plates. The ropes that hold up the mast are tied to those dead eyes, those blocks there. And now we're somewhere in the weather deck. No, we're not. We're looking at the water again. No, <laughs> this is quick. Okay, the endurance, guys. Look at the, uh, the piece of wood on the bottom there on the seabed. That is the rudder. That was the source of all their problems is when the ice got hold of the rudder, it ripped the rudder to one side. And at that moment, all the water started rushing into the endurance. And at that moment, they all knew that it was game over. And if you look very carefully behind the rudder, you can see where it's been torn away. The timbers have been ripped apart. There's a great big flow of ice that just came right across her stern. And that's what did it for them. That's what finished them off. And later that night, they abandoned the ship. At the moment that happened, they were all downstairs listening to gramophone music. The interesting thing is they knew something had happened to the ship, but none of them rushed up on deck to see what it was. They wanted to finish the song first. Can you believe it? <laughs> okay. That's the end of it? Yeah, Chris, we can't uh, see the video all that well on this end. I know it's, it's stunning, but we're, we're having a hard time keeping up with where you're viewing it. So maybe we can switch to some of the pictures if you have them ready. Yeah, absolutely. We'll 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 get those queued up in a second. And um, just to just to say again, congratulations to to both of you, to the rest of the crew, the rest of the expedition team. I know it truly has been an amazing team unified effort to make all of this happen. Um, it is it is really incredible. And and to hear hear your your stories about how it felt when it happened. Um, we have been absolutely giddy here, here uh, stateside about everything that's been happening. Um, and we'll let's let's. I want us to queue up a couple of photos the and then we can maybe talk a little bit about that. Seen the cartwheels and the somersaults this man yeah. was doing on the back deck. <laughs> I did not do cartwheels and somersaults. I'm a dignified archaeologist. Okay, this is still it's a stern again. Yeah, it was really interesting because you know, when you look at these stills, you remember all these stories from the endurance. And one story I remember was that the smallest guy in the team, a guy called Hussey, he used to play the banjo. It was his turn at the wheel. And the big thing they feared when they were at the wheel was in case the wheel gave a kick. If a piece of ice hit the rudder and the wheel would really kick hard. And sure enough, it happened to him. He was gripping the wheel hard. It got a slam of ice against the rudder. He caught the kick and he went flying. He walked away with just a few bruises, no broken bones or anything. So just right there, you can just see a little white thing beside the wheel. That's the apparatus that they use to measure the depth of water beneath the ship. You've got to remember when you're in a ship at sea, uh, it's pretty important to know where the land is. Very often the nearest land is right beneath your keel, so you want to know it's there. So you send down a wire with a weight on it and tells you how far away the land is, how deep they are. And, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, right, Tim, yeah, look at that porthole. That porthole there on the starboard side, on the other side of that, well, that was Shackleton's cabin. That's where the great man lived. Um, his bed was alongside the ship, and he had a poem on the wall between his uh, two portholes, which was by Rudyard Kipling. It was called If. 
Uh, look out when you get home this evening. It's worth a read. Oh, look at the door there. It's, it's like a batwing door, two leaves to it. Both doors are there, but you can see the steps going down. And if you look within the doorway there, there's a series of little what we call pigeonholes. And those pigeonholes took the signal flags, which they put up the mast when they wanted to communicate with another ship or whatever reason. That's where the flags were. Right, Great. Right, let's, yeah, let's go to the next photo. I think it's a, it's really amazing just to be able to see that. And I, and I know, Benson, I, I've heard you talk about this before, about how amazing it is that the, the clarity of the water and, and also how well preserved the ship is. So I'm wondering if you can tell some of our students about that. Yeah, I mean, the, the Weddell Sea has, I'm sure Chad will confirm this, the clearest water in the whole world. That yeah. you, you, I've, I've, I've heard it said and seen it written that you can actually see we're even up 80 meters underwater. And if you're a diver, that's almost unheard of. So the water was incredibly clear. But also the seas and the Weddell Seas are just perfect for the preservation of, of wood. There are no wood-consuming marine parasites in the Weddell Sea. By that, I mean there are no worms, no gribble worms or terrain worms that eat wood. So look at that picture there. I mean, the woodwork is absolutely fresh. What, you, what you're seeing there is her original paintwork. That's incredible. And you can see, look at the bunch. You can see yeah. the uh, the corking between yeah. the seams there, can't you, Chad? And it's, it's just unbelievable. You never see that with shipwrecks. I mean, Chad and I, over the years, have seen, I don't know, loads and loads and loads yeah, yeah. of shipwrecks, wooden shipwrecks, nothing is but nothing is pristine preservation. Yeah. In, my, yeah. in my entire career yeah. since I was 27 years old, I've spent my, all my adult life looking at, studying, excavating, surveying shipwrecks. But never, never have I seen a shipwreck like this. It's unbelievable. And it's sitting perfectly upright. How, what what would you have get, thought the, the chances were that it was sitting just perfectly as though it just rested very gently on the on the ocean floor so deep below? Well, actually, I kind of did sort of expect that. Mm -hmm. If we found the wreck, we discussed it a lot, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. But you remember... She had a lot of broken masts and things on the top deck. So when she sank, those masts would be trailing behind her, and they would impose a lot of drag on the ship as it was sinking through the water column. And then you have to think of the shape of the ship. You know, it's kind of streamlined from the keel going up the sides. It's like that. And so, divorced. And, yeah, absolutely so. And she probably stuck a little down at the bow, didn't she? Because yeah. we had those bow waves of mud on the seabed. Which again is perhaps not too surprising because when she sank, she went down at an angle of forty-five degrees right. bow and, first, and, and then that that depth gave it the momentum it needed when it hit. Yeah, hit. and of course the anchors and all of that <clears throat> chain were there yeah. right in the bow. Yeah, so it's quite an impact crater on the seabed there. You don't see it in these photographs, but it is there. But you know, to see it sitting upright and intact like that in that state of preservation, it's just mind blowing. It absolutely is, and absolutely. and um, I I would love to I would love to for us to be able to share some more images and some and some more of the stories. But um, this as as much as this is about this celebrating this amazing discovery, I do want to make sure that we also celebrate the fact that we have we have had students along this whole thing. As Tim, as you were mentioning, we have had oh, we have over a thousand classrooms that are have been following this for weeks live. We have had. Uh, we have over 25,000 students who are doing that, and we have many of those classrooms live on camera now. Um, so before we go into some more stuff, I'd like to bring in, um, yeah, we, let's bring in maybe, yeah, a couple more of those classrooms. Um, so just so we can, um, so just so we can, we can wave and, and say hi to, to, to Menson, to Chad. You can see we have classrooms from North Carolina, from Minnesota, New Jersey, Missouri, Colorado, even Namibia, all here. So if we can all give a, give Menson and Chad and Tim a big wave and thank you. This is really, really amazing. All right. <laughs> amazing. Um, so. Because it goes by this. 
So we'll we'll um, we're going to bring our classrooms in a little bit later and start asking some questions. But I did want to make sure that you you saw the the excitement that is happening, and we're getting I'm seeing a ton of questions coming in through the chat as well that we will definitely get to in just a uh, in in just a moment. Um, but uh, if I would like to maybe bring up, let's do like maybe one or two more uh, images. We can talk through those. Maybe we can talk through a little bit about the process of discovery since we have both of you on um, to be able to speak with us today about the process of, of what it's been like, the, all these hours spent of, of using the AUVs, of, of getting them to get the, the footage you needed and whatnot. Um, if we can maybe talk a little bit about that whole experience. Yeah, well, maybe Chad, you can jump in because Chad is like the hero of the backpack among right. other people. But Chad, Chad was out there in the freezing cold within, you know, the snow, the sleet, everything, fixing anything that went wrong. What, what were some of the challenges and what was sort of the, the how yeah. you fixed it? So some of the challenge, a lot of the issues we were having were <clears throat> uh, obviously the ice, it was the, uh, the fiber optic cable. Uh, it's, it was a 3.5 millimeter cable, uh, armor cable. It was, you know, it, it did the job but at the beginning. We were having a lot of issues with breaking the cable and having to redo the fiber optic splice. Um, that would have been, I guess, our weakest point. But uh, uh, we had a few issues for dealing with pressure and then the, the cold uh, on a thruster at the beginning. Um, and then a couple of issues with the winch, but then we got that sorted. And it, uh, we were just after that, launching and recovering, launching and recovering, you know. So it was uh, it was more so the fiber optics, you know, and then the cold and then the wind. And so <laughs> on the back day. Can you talk uh, for a minute about the light bulb? Because I think the light bulbs are a great <laughs> example of, like, it gives you a sense of the pressure. Yes, that the yes. So, under. so the, the light bulbs are rated to um, 3,000 meters on the AUV. And we were, you know, just right at 2980, 2985 on the meters depth. And every now and then we come up back to deck and start doing our, our maintenance on deck. And we noticed that these, these light bulbs <clears throat> from going under the pressure were cracked, you know, from the pressure at, at the deep sea. So, yeah, yeah. interesting. <laughs> there you go. That's one right Yeah, here. there's there's a great picture of Chad and all of his polar winter gear. Yeah, exactly. uh, getting that, that AUV named Ellie after Elephant Island. Yeah. Um, getting the AUV ready to launch again. Um, can you talk about like after a dive, after we recovered the saber tooth, what did you need to do in those three hours? So until it was ready to in this picture right here, uh, looks like we had just recovered because <clears throat> I'm in the process of, of uh, reorganizing the recovery rope that's going to be secured to the top end of the AUV. And you see the two red leads on the bottom side, of the, that's our battery charging cables. So uh, the LA, the, the AUV had just been recovered. We're getting it uh, ready to go back in the water after a three-hour charge. How many dives total did we do? I believe, if I remember correctly, it was 31 dives total. 31, 30 or 31, yeah, like yeah. four to eight-hour dives. Correct. Approximately. So that AUV was underwater yeah, a yeah. long time. Yeah, exactly. Once, uh, once we got, you know, at the beginning, we were having issues. <clears throat> and then we ironed the kinks out. And from that point, it was just dive after dive after dive, you know. So it, was, it wasn't it was on deck very long. When it got to, you know, three hours maximum on a, on a battery charge. And then we turned it around and went back, right back in the water to do the quiet area search. Yeah, spectacular. Well, how, how much of the search area did we end up searching before we found out? Um, from is eighty, yeah, I believe. Well, over yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We were running out of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was a thing. That was a scary bit. I mean, we were down to what three, four days. Yeah. Left. So, so every day I would walk on deck and say, "Today's the day, right? <laughs> Just today's the day." No, it used to come to me. I can smell it. I can, I can smell it. There's then well, the success. Yes. Then next day, you go, oh, that's it's so pungent, I can just smell it. And then the one day he said nothing to me. Yeah. You found it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we we were down to about, I think it was four or five, four days remaining, right? And so, you know, every day I would come out, today's the day. <laughs> and then that, that one day on the fifth, I was like, today's the day. You know? but I was so optimistic, right. but I was worried it's about something out of time. That's what counts. <laughs> yeah. Chris has a great picture up here. Um, Nancy, can you explain what we're looking at right now? Okay, so 
Let's see. That's the picture of the stern there, the ship's name. Well, where, where is this in the, on oh, the ship? Uh, yeah, this is right, right at the back. Okay, the top the top left screen there. Oh, I see. This, this, this is, is our controller. Yeah. I, I should yeah. leave this to to you, Chad. I mean, yeah. Yeah, so this is the, the program. Right, you walk in uh, the station surveyor's hit. Uh, top right is the, the multi beam data that's coming in from R2 Sonic. Uh, bottom right is the 4K camera feed. Uh, the back top left as well. And then also the Navipack survey uh, gear is uh, on the bottom left. Can you talk so, for, like, un what is Navipack survey? It is the, the software we use for, the, uh, for tracking the AUV and okay. all the survey lines and uh, coordinate systems. Okay, so you yeah. need to know exactly where that AUV is at all times. That's correct. Why, why, why is that important? Well, just for tracking purposes so we know where it's at and we can always, uh, um, you know, if, if we have, if we lose the fiber optic, uh, line of communication we can use the usbl system which is a, a short baseline that's tied into the navi pack to track the aub and recover okay. it if we have to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah we had to use the ether dump so the usbl system is, is almost strictly a tracking system uh and the dunker is going to be more sending the command to have it you know uh, travel back to, to us and so we can recover if we work so and that's happened a few times to recognize that as what was down in the moon pool correct that, that, yeah. that what was going down in the moon pool helped the ship understand really exactly where in relation to the ship that's the AUV correct. was at all time yeah. so if we lost communication we could get back that's and correct. 31 or so times launch 31 times we brought it right back yeah every time no problem times it had to go with the emergency system you know dump but, system but we got it and uh and perfect record for recovery that's so, that is incredible uh, Chris, and, and i want to i want to sorry i wanted to, to just just quickly touch on that point that how, how successful and, and and everything was the the fact that it worked well the the systems you didn't have to go to backup or emergency plans which i know that you had in spades that this this is really important to for everyone to know that that you had plans on plans and um, but everything worked as as uh, as planned and every you had your plan A's and that was enough. I, I think also just to remind everyone about when you're talking about the moon pool, if, if people remember a few live streams back, the moon pool is actually the open bit of water that you can access to the Weddell Sea from the ship. So you can actually open a small cover on the in the interior of the ship and it goes directly down into that. And so we, we actually have some footage on the Reach the World website at reachtheworld.org where you can actually see them dropping something into that moon pool. And um, and that was exactly what, what Chad was just discussing. So just wanna make sure that, that everyone knows that there's that opportunity to be able to see that stuff um, and to understand exactly the amazing stuff that Chad um, is, is doing. Um, I, I want to start getting into questions and all the fun stuff there, but before we do, um, I think Tim and Chad, you both have some people you want to shout out because you know that they're watching today. Is that correct? I believe so. Hey, Hadi, Kristen, everybody. <laughs> I, this, this is I, I just want to say hello and thank you to all of the students who have followed this journey. I cannot underestimate, as a person who communicated most directly with the teachers around the world who are following, uh, I've passed along all your, your good wishes and all your support and all of your great questions to the members of this expedition over the last few months. And I can tell you, and I hopefully speak on behalf of the whole expedition, that those that support really kept us going through some of the days when it was yeah. cold and all we were seeing was uh, empty sea bottom. Yeah. And you don't you don't get to finding a wreck like this, but just the people on the ship. There are lots and lots of people who supported each of us and everybody on the ship the entire route. And we just want to say thank you, thank you to, to all of you. You know who you are. Yeah, I, I, I echo that in uh, uh, with all of the fiber of my being. And I think everyone here at Reach the World and the rest of the, the team um, that has been on, on board doing this and doing this work would, would agree with that. Um, I do want to make sure to shout out all the different locations of people tuning in. I had mentioned we'll, we have some amazing classrooms from all over the US and even the world. Um, but we have people that are actually tuning in right now from Brooklyn, New York, from Arizona, Texas, Canada, Maryland, Illinois, Wisconsin, California, Mexico, France. So 
we have a, a very global, very, very popular, exciting audience. We have, we have hundreds of folks that are tuning in live. It's really exciting to be able to do that. Um, and so, and so let's start, let's, let's go over to the students. Let's go over to the questions. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to go to, let's go first to St. Louis, um, to Ms. Turley's classroom. Uh, Ms. Turley, if, if one of your students has a question, please fire away. Okay. Thank you. So what we're saying, one, two, three. All right, Kalia, come on up. I'm going to show you. All right. Stand in there so they can see the flag. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Kalia Walker, and I have a question for you. Is the ship? Is the ship where Shackleton left it? Did you hear her question? She wants to know if the ship is right where Shackleton left it. Oh, that's a that's an excellent question. Sorry, Chris. If there's a question, okay. Um, we couldn't, we so, couldn't hear. Sorry, Chris. Will you repeat? Yeah, absolutely. So they wanted to know: Is the ship where Shackleton left it? So, so maybe we can talk about how 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 far away the ship was found from where where the the coordinates were last taken. Okay, so where was the ship? Where was the relationship to where, to where the last time? Well, yeah. So in fact, you if you remember. We had only one thing to go on when we started this, this search, and that was a set of coordinates were left to us by the ship's captain, a man called Frank Worsley. And that was the only thing I had to start the search with. But the problem was how accurate was it? And for reasons that are a bit complicated and long to go into, we found out that those coordinates were not quite as good as we thought they were. So the question became, well, where is she in relation to where Frank Worsley said she was? And when we found her, she was not that far away, actually. She was 4.16 kilometers to the south. Um, yeah, so we looked east and west before we'd gone south. And there she was, wonderful moment. Wow, great question. Love the answer. It, it just proves how amazing um, the, the folks were in, um, in terms of their able their ability to sight using mainly celestial navigation to be able to get a better sense of, of where the where the ship was going down. Um, let's go from let's go from St. Louis all the way to Namibia to the Luterate <laughs> Blue School. And let's see if we have a question there. Luterates, I think you're muted. All right. <laughs> Did you think you were going to find it? Did you guys hear that one? <laughs> no, no, sorry. So she wants to know, did you think you were going to find it? Every day. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> you know, today is the day. But again, we were we were starting to clear out the whole search box, and it was it was the one area, you know, the last few days that we finally moved to the South Side and then started searching. But yeah, we were we were a little bit toward the very end, but you know, I, I heard it was from, only because we were you know the, the, the amount of days we had remaining. I heard from multiple people that it's a thing in shipwreck <laughs> searching that you either find it right away, you find it on yeah. like the last oh, day, yeah. and that proved true once again with this search yeah. that you yeah. found it right right at the last minute. Inevitable. <laughs> Amazing. I thank you for that question. I love it because I think it speaks to how much dedication explorers need to have, how much focus and commitment to to the vision. And again, credit to you all and the rest of your team for, for your, your stick to itiveness to as you do that. Let's go from, from Namibia, Namibia. We're going to come back over the Atlantic to North Carolina, to Salisbury, North Carolina, um, yes. and see if we have a question from Salisbury Academy. Hello, we do have a couple questions for you. Um, Belle, why don't you uh, go ahead and ask your question? Were there any scary moments or crazy moments while y'all were trying to find it? 
All right. So were there any scary or crazy moments when you were trying to find endurance? Hmm. Hmm. Not this time, no. but the first campaign. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. During the first campaign, we came seriously stuck in the ice. We were worried. How many? Yeah. Well, it's a couple of days. Yeah, three it was days. Long. It was. It was getting. <clears throat> we, were, we were concerned, to say the least. I think for this expedition, yeah. it was the first time the fiber optic cable broke. Yeah. And uh, quick thinking of. Uh, uh, my colleagues and some engineers to get together and we load the right. dumper system to to get it back all, in all that first dive when you had the pressure problems remember yeah i thought this would be the pattern of everything right right yeah, and yeah. it wasn't yeah. you know the vehicle then yeah like i said it was well. the first yeah. dive that really that really it was a scare but yeah. once we ironed out the kinks and everything else it was it was great after that it's so nice to be on the other side of that <laughs> it isn't is. it and yeah. you can reflect yeah. and laugh about it yeah. 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 it's pretty high at that you know, time and just like, oh. it's also worth noting in this situation that having the wreck was you know one part of a very challenging multi-layer problem <laughs> just knowing getting the ship where it needed to be right. was a chance sometimes watching the weather constantly, watching the ice situation, uh, making sure that we had a route out of the Weddell Sea so we didn't get trapped in the Weddell Sea for the winter. Um, but, you know, we sort of planned for a lot of that by picking this amazing ship that we're on, which mm -hmm. just plowed right through that Weddell Sea and got us out in no time um, yesterday. And, and, you know, you also have all the, if we could work on the deck or use the best weed up, all the contingencies that were thought of by Nico Vincent, you know what I mean? The, the ice camp, it would have had to do with or anything like that. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. Amazing. And and uh, I'm, we're about to... Good question, Salisbury. Thank you. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, so we're going to switch now to um, to Hasbrook Heights, New Jersey, to Ms. Schaefer's fifth grade classroom. I know they have been extremely dedicated. They're they're getting ready to go to, to, go to lunch, so we want to make sure that they have a chance to ask their question. Um, Ms. Schaefer, what do you got? How did the ship didn't decay over time? All right, so um, so my 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 friends aboard the Agullis too. Um, how, why didn't the ship decay over time? Okay, so yeah, a couple of things there. I mean, main thing was that there there. Uh, there was no wood consuming organisms there that eat their way through the wood. There were no worms, no shipworm, no gribble worms. Yeah, and, and nothing there which 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 could stick, but that was the main thing. Uh, the coal was, of course, important as well. The depth certainly helps because it keeps away all the fish and things like that. There's not a lot of life down there that we can see. There's other life there we cannot see. But uh, there's nothing that's really iniquitous to the ship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're very lucky because normally you don't see shipwrecks like that, guy, I tell you. And the fact that she held together, you know, there was this enormous impact and the release of energy when she hit the seabed. And Chad and I, we could think of many wrecks where wooden wrecks do uh, in other, other parts of the world where the wooden ship just hit the seabed and whoop opened up like that or broke sort of thwart ships across mm -hmm. but she was held she held together beautifully and that's because of the strength of her primary construction yeah great tribute to the to a ship yeah she was built for the ice wasn't she it's a it's an incredibly built ship that we can i can we can see it even in the footage that we've been able to see today um so so i, I want to bring up miss oaks's class we're going all the way to minnesota um, and as we get Miss Oaks's class ready to go, I, I want to mention we've seen some questions in the chat about um, about who the descendants are of the um, of the different members of the of the expedition uh, and and some questions about that, which is really great to see. There um, there are descendants of many of the the members of the crew, and it's important to note that one of the most amazing aspects of the endurance, the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition, where the endurance sank in 1915 everyone on that on the endurance survived 
Uh, and and it was and it just is a is yet another testament to the leadership ability and the dedication of not only the boss Sir Ernest Shackleton and the rest of the crew. Um, okay, so let's go to Minnesota, Miss Oaks's class. Okay, fire away, Miss Oaks. Okay, fire away, Miss Oaks. All right, say it again. What's the most interesting thing you found out about the endurance? That's a good one. So what is the most interesting thing you found out about the endurance? Just so surprisingly, the way it's sitting on the seabed, you know, yeah. in its preservation, preservation state. Yeah, it's just the general disposition and appearance of the ship. I mean, it's incredible. I suppose it was a little minute. I remember sitting with you one day at dinner, and you flashed up a picture for me on, on, on the phone. It was of that boot that was laying there. In the uh, yeah, yeah. And then there was the time we were looking for something, the, the, the crockery was here, yeah. the boots and the cups. And those moments, you kind of make a kind of mind touch with, with, with the people on, on, on the endurance. It's that boot there in the middle of the ship. That was, that was quite a moment. Yeah. That was interesting, yeah. And we could look down into where the cabins were. And because I know, you know, they've got eight portholes along each side. And I know whose cabin is behind each porthole. That was kind of nice, you know. That was, and we could see our reflection in the glass of the portholes. That was the incredible thing. You could see the, the AUV sort of swimming by there. You know, thanks to Frank Hurley's famous photographs, we yeah, we know, right. like, to me, at least, as someone who's looked at those photographs and studied this expedition, seeing those places on the real ship right. makes an instant connection to the photographs. You're like, oh, that's where that photo was taken, yeah, you know? And you, you, can imagine, the you can imagine these, these, these people from 107 years ago standing in this spot on yeah. the ship and because the ship is in such a great state of preservation, it's even easier right. to remember because it looks like it just sank yesterday. So uh, that... if we were raised up, we could say it off to South <laughs> Georgia or something. <laughs> Interesting thought. It's it, it's it, just the the amazing the amazing uh, nature of the ship is incredible. <laughs> um, I I want to switch now. I'll come over from Minnesota to New Jersey to Sayreville, New Jersey to Miss Hawk and Joe's class. I know your students have been extremely patient. They actually waited through lunch so they could sit in on the very first part of this. Um, I can see the amazing Endurance Twenty Two flag in the background. We love seeing that. Um, so, do you have a question for our amazing folks aboard the SA Agullis Two? I want to say congratulations. This is a big accomplishment that you finally found the ship. But now, what are your next step, steps from here? Is the expedition over? Is there people you still have to contact left? What are you gonna What are you gonna do now that you found the ship? All right. So, so we have a, uh, an excellent question that I was wondering as well. What's next? What are you going to do next? What are what are your plans? What are the what are the next steps of the expedition? We we want to know what's coming up. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, right, right. You know, we did a little a little day celebration out on the ice. You know, enjoying it. You know, able to walk around get off on the ship a little while. And then now we're actually heading to South Georgia Island to visit Chapleton's grave. So that's going to be an amazing uh, in this great adventure, you know. Cool. Yeah, Chris, I think we actually have some pictures of our, our celebration on the ice. Um, the, the crew, I believe it was the chippy on board the ship. Maybe yeah, the made a, yeah, the carpenter made a, a sign to commemorate the the first the arrival at the general site of endurance and then the finding of of the ship um and the crew put down a gangplank right up the side of the ship and the ice camp team even though we didn't really use the ice camps set up a big mess tent and some of the tents that would have been used to sleep on the ice uh there's a soccer ball out yeah. i think there was uh some it's rugby <laughs> yeah there's some rugby being played lots of picture taking yeah. general celebrating and we had a great meal on the ice uh it was really uh a really fun day yeah. for us to all celebrate after working yeah, pretty hard for great several weeks. so 
So, so step one is to celebrate. We want to always honor our accomplishments, absolutely. And then step, and then step two is to head to South Georgia, or, uh, to South Georgia, to be able to um, to be able to to pay tribute to the boss himself. Um, and and the end of the endurance uh, saga when um, when after the ship was sunk, that was where they were rescued at the whaling station that used to be there. Uh, it, really incredible, and we're sharing some of those amazing images of the ice camp of the ship in the ice. Tim, you and I had an amazing conversation uh, and that we'll be able to share to reach the world's channel very soon. We're seeing some of the great food. Um, but but I do want to make sure that we get a we get a chance to bring in a, the last few classroom questions. We have some amazing questions from different members of our environment. So um, thank you so much, Sarahville. We're going to stay in New Jersey now. We're going to go over to Hillsdale. Uh, Ms. Paz's class, uh, I can see you all. We have another amazing Endurance 22 flag there. Uh, Ms. Paz's class, do, do one of your students have a question? <clears throat> All right. Do you guys have a question for us? Looks like we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can get that sorted out. And um, for the time being, until we get that sorted out, we're going to go from New Jersey. We'll, we'll come back to you in a second. We're going to go from New Jersey to Colorado. Uh, we'll go to Boulder, Colorado to Friends School and see, yep, see another flag. Love seeing that and see um, see if some, one of your students from Friends School, third graders. You have a question. Uh, what's, what's the most important? Uh, are you most excited? Well, I mean, what piece are you most excited to find on the endurance? Oh, that is an excellent question. What part of endurance? What part of the ship? What piece of it are you? Were you most excited to find or to see? Stern <laughs> with the name on the back end, definitely the stern. That yeah. that just ver solidified and verified everything for us. You know. You mean you have doubts about no, that? No, not at all, but we definitely need to see that. <laughs> oh, you know what we should say, Chad, is that um, this is quite important. We didn't touch anything. We didn't take anything. We didn't sample anything. This was uh, non-disturbance archaeology. Yeah. So we came, we saw, we measured in detail. Now we're leaving. Yeah. Um, did anything surprise you? about what we found. Are there any mysteries that you've been wondering that like you immediately got the answer to when you saw the wreck? Yeah, there were a couple of things actually, but I think perhaps the one thing that um, really just a bit powerful that was the hole in the deck. Because reading the diaries, I knew that when the ship was start to go down, all ship's food and supplies were still within the hole. So what they tried to do was cut holes in the, in the deck. Okay. And you remember there's that big hole that mm -hmm. on the side was? Yeah. I know what that was there for. They had to make up boat hooks, stuck it down into the water, try to fish food. There was a cabin called Billabong. If that forward set, uh, let's see, the ship's doctor, Nathan McElroy, and the Australian with the public for Hurley, and the other one was Aussie. The, the musician. Mm -hmm. um, so that hole was there. And there were a couple of other holes there as well, which I, I, I knew they cut. And you could see there, there are places on the deck where it's sore through timbers, mm -hmm. you know, they needed in the ice camp. So that was kind of a special moment. But, you know, again, guys, we didn't take anything, didn't touch anything. We just recorded. I, I think recorded, that's recorded. We should add a very high tech way. Definitely. I mean, I, I heard. <clears throat> Just by, by others and many people as one of the most advanced surveying yeah, of a, of yeah, a shipwreck we, we, ever. We, we did a, a lot of side scan, multi beam, uh, laser scanning, high definition cameras, just everything. Any possible, every square inch of this ship, we, we got pictures of or a detailed scan so we can eventually, you know, create a 3D model or, you know, just bring it to life with, with those scans and those sonars. And it's really accurate. Yes. Yeah. To ten thousand feet underneath yep. the water, you can pinpoint something Correct. to a millimeter accuracy. That is just amazing to me. It, yep. it it's amazing to me too. Um, so thank you so much, Friend School. We're gonna we're gonna try and come back from Colorado to New Jersey to Hillsdale. See if we can if we had their audio is fixed. Um, and.
can't really tell. I think you might still be having some issues with your audio, but thank you so much for, I do know the class, uh, the, the question that you're, you're, you're interested in asking. So I will ask it for you. So did you have to change your method of finding endurance at all? So, so did you come with a plan and then realize that you had to change it once you, once you got to the search site? I believe it was more so dealing with the drift. Yeah, it was. We thought the problem was going to be dealing with longitude, but in the end, we realized it wasn't that at all. It was, it was a problem that we had at all the drift. Yeah, that caught us by surprise. Um, the, 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 sea ice, yeah, the sea ice drift. Uh, so we, we, we had a plan <clears throat> initially uh, when we arrived. The, the drift, the current surface current was drifting from southwest to north, uh, sorry, southeast to northwest. Uh, so the initial survey was done in the, the first uh, uh, AUE survey was done in the, the southeast corner. Uh, during that dive, we had already started experiencing where the, the current was changing direction. So uh, from that point, we had to really start planning according to the drift uh, of the models of the forecast and everything else. So that, that was another, you know, big issue that, that we were dealing with, uh, constantly changing direction and had to go different areas of the search box to compensate for the, uh, the ice flow. Wow, I, I think that's really it's so amazing that you were able to to even um, be able to to limit your search box and to then just just so methodically so focused on on getting these things done. So we're we're that it's just incredible the work that you all are doing. Um, so thank you so much, Miss Paz's class. Um, I do I know we're running a little bit low on time, um, so I do want to try and see if we can very quickly go through some of the questions that we've gotten from the chat. Um, so we're going to try and very briefly go through some of these questions. Um, so one question that we really liked was, um, how, what do you, how do you think Shackleton felt? How do you think Shackleton would feel about the, about the success of your mission? Yeah. I think he'd be quite happy. Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's the first time I've seen Chad like this. I mean, I seriously, I saw yeah, yeah. he was in South Africa. I mean, he's completely just, it was yeah. like a bank ball. Yeah, yeah. just your eyes and cold and back to the other layer up and cut the crease and everything. Yeah. But do you remember that night I was out there with you and you pointed like that to the tether? And I looked at the tether and the water on the tether frozen, yeah, frozen. in a time it took. For that cable to, to, to come up out of the water to go on the drum. A minute and a half, it is frozen. Yeah. But who was the guy whose, whose eyelids froze solid? Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I was a bit of a It was so cold that the, that the, um, the pole was, was, was biting the, the his moisture. eyes. And he started, yeah, and his legs started to cry from the cold. And then the, uh, the cold froze tears, and that's a seal of his eyes closed. I, don't, I shouldn't be laughing like this, but it's kind of funny now. At the time, it was, it was quite, uh, quite worrying. So cool. to get uh, a chip hammer. <laughs> so we got, I mean, to a limited extent, we got a taste of what Shackleton and the insurance yeah. crew dealt with. We obviously didn't have the same part of We had plenty of right. hot drinks, yeah. and you know, we got inside and warm up. up it's it's right, for a but I think there's a great, throughout a great connection to history that when you get out on the ice or you spend a cold night on the back deck, you get a deep appreciation right. for what Shackleton went through. And for that reason, I, I think, uh, I, I agree. I think Shackleton would be, okay, would, would still be Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's it. And, 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 and the fact that the, the entire crew aboard the Endurance, aboard the endurance survived. Uh, and that with, with relatively minimal injuries, I think the worst was that, uh, I believe, Purse Blackborough, the stowaway aboard, lost a few toes. And that was, for the most part, the, the extent of the injury, even being out exposed on, on the open ocean, um, frozen and open ocean for so long. Uh, there's a number of questions that we've also got in the chat about um, whether there's any plan or intent um, or if you had gone into the ship. Um, so I know, I know that there's a lot of questions about because there's some open hatches that maybe there's a chance for exploration there. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that and maybe why you either can or can't? 
uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. There were a couple of open hatches. We could look down. Uh, there's quite a lot of clutter inside, wasn't there? Yeah. But uh, I suppose in decades to come, there might be technology which would allow us to enter through some of those little chinks and have a look around and not touch anything, but to photograph and illuminate what was there. There's a lot of openings on the starboard side where you can actually look into cabin areas. So it's a possibility for the future. Amazing. So we are we are running low on time, and and I want to make sure that we bring back all of our classrooms um, as we as we close up today. I, I I appreciate all of the questions. We'll do our best to answer those in the future. You can always contact us at reachtheworld.org. Um, but um, I, if I if I could just have everyone who's who's on camera to say um, uh, maybe on the count of three, give us a a, a really big wave and a cheer. And and let's just let's celebrate the amazing work of the crew aboard the SA Agullas II, the expeditionary team, but especially Tim Menson and Chad who have been joining us today. So please, please unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves. <laughs> to, uh, to, to end things with, with you all today, I, I do want to, again, on behalf of Reach the World, on behalf of the, the amazing organizations, the team here, and, and so many other people who are following this, over 1,000 classrooms, over 25,000 students who have been following this expedition with bated breath, I want to make sure to mention this is not the end. We have more live streams coming up. We have more stories to tell. As as uh, Tim and Mention and Chad have mentioned, they are on their way to South Georgia to pay respects to the boss, Sir Ernest Shackleton's uh, final resting place. And we have more stories to tell. There's a lot more for us to talk about and to and to be excited about for this expedition. That that as as great of an an exciting experience this is to be able to share with the world. We have a lot more to do, and there's a lot more. Uh, there's a lot more to learn, and we're excited to learn along with you. Um, so, with that, Tim, Menson, Chad, um, I'll give you the final. I'll give you the final words of the day before we close out. Sum it up. Oh, uh, sum it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, kids, it's all about Shackleton. What Shackleton is all about? It's all about man's indomitable urge to be expanding his boundaries all the time. So. Kids, listen to your teachers, aim high, think good thoughts, and um, you know what? Life can really be beautiful sometimes. Ditto. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining, and we'll be back very, very soon.